listening to Nurture here and I hope that you all are having an amazing fall. Today I am going to do a video with you guys about spinal cord injuries. And I would like to thank Anatomy Warehouse for sending me this really cool anatomy model of the spine. And this is what I'm going to use to bring you guys this video today. So I'm going to do this video for you guys using this study guide I made about spinal cord injuries. And if you are subscribed to Nursing to Nurture newsletters, you should already have a copy of this. So a spinal cord injury is an injury to the vertebral column, the spinal cord itself, intervertebral discs, or supporting soft tissue. So some common causes of spinal cord injuries include motor vehicle crashes, falls, sports-related injuries. Spinal cord injuries may also be violence inflicted. And spinal cord injuries are typically classified by the area of the spinal cord injury. So this blue area right here is our sacral spine. A spinal cord injury here would be classified as a sacral spinal cord injury. This red color coded area is going to be our lumbar spine. And a spinal cord injury here would be classified as a lumbar spinal cord injury. This orange color coded part of the model is called your thoracic spine. So this would be considered a thoracic spine injury. And then the green color coded part is going to be our cervical spine and this would be classified as a cervical spine injury. And we're actually going to start at the sacral spine for the best visual in my opinion. And you guys will see that as we work our way up to the cervical spine, nursing intervention starts to get a little bit more critical symptoms as well. So I'm going to try to make this video as straightforward as possible. So I'm going to talk about each spinal cord injury and I'm going to talk about what we would do as the nurse to care for this patient. Our main concerns. I'm not going to talk about every detail but I'm going to try to hit the main importance. So let's start with the sacral spinal cord injury. A patient with a sacral spinal cord injury would lose all sensation to their peritoneum and they would also lose voluntary control over their external anal sphincter. So our goal as the nurse is going to be to improve bowel function. A patient with a sacral spinal cord injury is going to call for the following nursing interventions. One, we want to establish a bowel regimen. We also want to administer prescribed stool softeners, stimulants, as well as laxatives, um, especially if your patient is on heavy narcotics. And of course, we want to get these patients up and moving because mobility helps with gut motility. Also, after a patient acquires a spinal cord injury, they are at high risk for developing a paralytic ileus. And I actually learned this when I was working on a very toxic spine unit. But this is usually caused by paralysis of the bowel. Depending on the severity of the paralytic ileus, a nasal gastric tube may have to be placed. This is done to, of course, relieve this tension because the bowel isn't moving. Also to prevent aspiration and vomiting. In a perfect nursing world, bowel function usually returns within a week. In the real world, it just depends on the patient. Moving on to lumbar spinal cord injuries. Let's start with L3 to L5. A patient with an L3 to L5 spinal cord injury may still be independent, won't really rely on nursing for much. Now as we work our way up to L1 to L2, these patients begin to lose a little bit more mobility of the lower body. There is impaired adduction of the hip. Um, in addition to that, these patients also begin to lose sensation below their lower abdomen with some sensation still left in the inner thighs. That's why a lot of times patients with L1 to L2 spinal cord injuries are independent and are able to drive. All right, now let's get into our thoracic spine injuries. And you guys will see that this is where things start to get a little bit real compared to our sacral and lumbar spine injuries. And that's actually the reason I wanted us to start at the sacral spinal cord and work our way up because I wanted you guys to see that the higher the spinal cord injury, the more of the body that is affected. So this is our T7 to T12. The patient with the T7 to T12 spinal cord injury begins to have no sensation below their waist. They have little to no sensation of their abdomen and trunk. Now as we get to our T1 to T6 spinal cord injuries, these patients can still extend their elbow, they can still flex their wrists, and they still have some control over their fingers. However, there is paralysis below the waist. 
So this means that these patients cannot fill their bladder. So keep that in mind. These patients with T1 to T6 spinal cord injuries cannot fill their bladder. Very important. As we get to our T6 spinal cord injuries, we are going to start to worry about something called autonomic dysreflexia. And this usually occurs in our spinal cord injuries that are at T6 or above. So any spinal cord injury T6 or above puts the patient at risk for autonomic dysreflexia. Autonomic dysreflexia is an exaggerated sympathetic response that occurs after spinal shock subsides. Autonomic dysreflexia is a medical emergency. It can lead to seizures, stroke, it can also be fatal. Now remember we said that our patients with a T1 to T6 spinal cord injury cannot feel their bladder. But guess what? Having a full bladder is the biggest cause of autonomic dysreflexia. And again, not only does autonomic dysreflexia cause seizures and stroke, but it can also be fatal. So this is why a full bladder is a major concern for this patient. Now in addition to having a full bladder, other causes of autonomic dysreflexia include skin breakdown, impact the feces, overstretch muscles, or extreme hot or cold temperatures. So what can we do as the nurse to prevent autonomic dysreflexia? Well, first we need to know the signs and symptoms of autonomic dysreflexia. The signs and symptoms of autonomic dysreflexia include severe hypertension, a slow heart rate, nausea. The patient may complain that they have blurred vision. The patient may complain that they have a pounding headache. You may see them sweating a lot. You may see goosebumps. They may have anxiety, flushed skin. They may also have some nasal congestion or nasal stuffiness. Now we know the signs and symptoms, so what else are we going to do as the nurse to prevent autonomic dysreflexia in our patients with T1 to T6 spinal cord injuries? We want to maintain this patient in an upright position. This is going to decrease their blood pressure decrease that severe hypertension. We may also need to place a Foley catheter to get rid of that bladder distension because again, they can't feel when their bladder is full, but we definitely don't need them having a full bladder because again, autonomic dysreflexia can occur and it can be fatal. Now, as we just said, impact of feces is also a common cause of autonomic dysreflexia. So we definitely want to monitor for constipation. And in addition to that, we also said that skin breakdown can cause autonomic dysreflexia. So we also want to monitor for skin breakdown. Make sure we have this patient on a turn and reposition system. And guys, we may also administer antihypertensives intravenously to decrease that hypertension and decrease that pounding headache. And in addition to this, we also want to educate our patient because autonomic dysreflexia can occur years after a spinal cord injury has occurred. Now let's move our way up to our last type of spinal cord injury, which is going to be our cervical spinal cord injuries. All right, so the patient with the C6 to C7 spinal cord injury, they can still doors flex and extend their wrist. Now our patients with the C5 spinal injuries, they may still have head and neck control, shoulder strength, and they may still be able to flex their elbows. However, these patients may need assistance with meals and they will need maximal assistance with ABL care. Now, once we get to our C4 spinal cord injuries, this is where things start to get a little bit shaky. I'll tell you guys why in just a minute. So our patients with the C4 spinal cord injuries, just like our patients with the C5 spinal injuries, they still have good head and neck syndrome. Sensation. Now here's where things get serious. The patients with the C4 spinal cord injuries have some sensation of the diaphragm. Now if you guys remember back to anatomy and physiology, what is the function of the diaphragm? Your diaphragm aids in inhale and exhale. So only having some movement of the diaphragm puts this patient at risk for respiratory compromise. This is why I said when we work our way up the spine, especially in the cervical spine areas, nursing interventions and symptoms start to get a little bit more critical for our patients. In addition to this, these patients with the C4 spinal injuries will be dependent for bowel elimination. And remember, as we said earlier, just a little reminder, a spinal cord injury anywhere in the spine puts the patient at risk for a paralytic ileus. All right guys, we're almost done. So let's talk about our C2 to C3 cervical spinal cord injuries. 
Once we start to talk about our C2 to C3 spinal cord injuries, keep in mind that these patients have lost sensation underneath their clavicle bone. So their mobility is very limited. They will be dependent on nursing for ADL care. Now something much more important. The patient with a C2 to C3 spinal injury can only breathe independently for short periods of time. So still, high risk for respiratory compromise. Airway patency is going to be our priority priority once we hit the cervical spine. Now the patient with the C1 spinal injury has little to no control or sensation of the head and neck. There is absolutely no control over the diaphragm. So remember, C4, some control over the diaphragm, but not much. C2 to C3, there's control over the diaphragm, but only in small increments. But once we get to the C1 spinal injury, there is no control over the diaphragm at all. Just like our C2 spinal cord injury patients, our patients with a C1 spinal injury still has very limited mobility and will still rely on nursing for ADL care. All right guys, so in a nutshell, our biggest concern for these patients with the cervical spine injuries is going to be respiratory compromise. As we just said, this patient may need mechanical ventilation, but also keep in mind that these patients are at high risk for aspirating. So airway patency is going to be our priority. So how do we prevent respiratory compromise in the patient with the cervical spine injury? We want to monitor pulse oxygen saturation levels. We want to monitor ABGs. And we also want to be on the lookout for those signs and symptoms of ineffective airway clearance because as we just said, these patients are at high risk for aspirating. Ineffective airway clearance may be evidenced by your patient having that wide-eyed look, shortness of breath, increased respiratory rate. You may hear like a gurgling noise as if they're trying to clear their throat. Now something that I want to emphasize, the reason that these patients are at risk for ineffective airway clearance is because they cannot cough. They can't cough to clear those secretions from their airway. And this is just a side note, something that I wanted to share with you guys, speaking of suction. When you first get your assignment in the morning and you do your rounds, please make sure that suction is working in each of your patient's room because it's nothing like having an emergency and you go reach for the suction to turn it on and then when you need it, you find out that it's not working. Always make sure that suction is working at the start of each shift. All right, guys, so I know that was a lot. That's why we're going to do a really quick recap so we can understand what our main concerns are as a nurse. So for our sacral injuries, our main concern is bowel elimination, improving bowel function. Our patients with a lumbar spinal cord injury, these patients are still independent for the most part, but we still want to promote mobility because if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Now, once we get to our thoracic spine injuries, we understand that our biggest concern is... I'm sorry, I'm just laughing because my voice is just like so hoarse. Even when I do like the animated videos and like the PowerPoints, I usually like record in increments. I'm not used to like recording like straight through like this. Anyway, once we reach our thoracic spine, our biggest concern is going to be autonomic dysreflexia. And then once we reach our cervical spine injuries, our main concern is going to be airway patency, maintaining airway patency and being on the lookout for respiratory compromise. And also keep in mind that the higher the spinal injury, the more of the body that is affected. And it's really so much more to spinal cord injuries. And again, I'm really just hitting the main importance for the sake of time for this video. But keep in mind that the study guide that I sent out has so much more. It really gets into other things such as as preventing respiratory infections in patients with spinal cord injuries, preventing weight loss, DVTs. But I don't know, if you guys show this video enough love, I'll just plug it into the description or put it up on my website. It just depends. We'll see. I hope that this video was helpful. I hope that it summarizes spinal cord injuries in the most simplified way as possible. And I hope that you guys subscribe. And I hope that you guys give this video a thumbs up. And in addition to that, I hope you guys share this video with someone, whether it be a peer, a classmate, a teacher, a student, someone you know that's in nursing school or in medical school, just send it to someone. All right, guys, remember to never give up. And as always, thanks for watching.